first question, Mary, that you came up the hard way about Colin Kina. I know an awful lot of people nowadays go to university, study journalism, get a master's degree, but I think you did things the difficult way. So maybe you tell I'm us not that. I'm sure it's the hard way, but uh, I don't. First of all, I don't have a journalism degree. I have a, I have a BA in history and classical civilization. So uh, not quite sure what preparation that was for the law. Um, and uh, and I studied to be a teacher. Uh, I got a HDIP in education, and then I got waylaid by student politics. And I was a campaign officer in the Union of Students in Ireland, and part of that was writing for USI News. And uh, I was the editor of USI News, so I became in I was always interested in writing, really. And um, uh, and then I kind of drifted into journalism. That's the only way I can put it, really. Uh, I. Uh, I was friendly with a few journalists, and they said, uh, would you write a few articles for the Irish News in Belfast? And then six months later, I was the correspondent of the Irish News in Belfast, and uh, I held that position for a few years, but it wasn't particularly well paid. So uh, I did some freelancing on the side, and I was friendly with these guys who ran an agency called Ireland International News Agency, and their main uh, work was to report the courts. And uh, so I ended up covering murder trials uh, without a huge amount of uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of in the deep end. But, uh, well, I picked up a lot of useful skills, I think, working for the Irish News, because you have to do a bit of everything I was taught for. Reporting about farming policy, I was reporting about uh, politics, uh, I was at government briefings, I really you were doing the smallest things and the biggest things, so it was actually kind of excellent yeah. preparation so you in some ways. A very good background, an apprenticeship if you like. An apprenticeship. Yeah. So, the, yeah, so the next thing I wanted to ask you about was this, I think it's the first time you and I met, and I think it's probably fair if this ever goes on YouTube that we don't mention any names because I don't want to drag people who have very bad memories back into a sphere that uh, should be long gone or they're entitled to forget about. But uh, we met in a particularly gruesome murder trial a long time ago. Now, what I want, really wanted to ask you about that was, did you ever feel, in reporting on these cases, that if you had had the benefit of a law degree, you, you'd be better better able to report, or is the process of reporting different, I suppose, to the to the process of legal analysis? Um, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't actually think you need a law degree to report the courts. Um, in some ways, I think it might be a slight handicap, because uh, sometimes a little law is a dangerous thing, mm. uh, which might be evident for some, from some questions personal litigants and dare I say even some lawyers. Uh, but um, no, I, I, I think you pick up a lot as you go along and a, a lot of my job was to really translate legalese into understandable, an understandable story that people can follow, but also to try and distill the main legal points uh, uh, obviously, you're helped if the barrister is clear, uh, particularly in opening murder trials or whatever, where they lay out the points. Uh, it's actually easier, in a way, reporting criminal trials before a jury because the barristers have to explain to the jury. So, therefore, uh, reporters can benefit from that lesson as well in, in basic law, basic prosecution law and defence law. And, uh, so you do pick up a lot, and I was probably lucky to start with criminal law because mm -hmm. it was before jury and it was explained, and I did a lot in the special criminal court as well. I think when I moved into the area of civil law, you, you do have to do a crash course in a huge amount of complex areas, uh, but... Um, yeah, well, that's, like, that's an interesting thing because... I know my attitude as a barrister was, was very simple. I was never going to, if a reporter asked me about something, I was never going to tell them what a client had told me. But I was perfectly happy to do two things. Number one, to say what had happened in court or what had been said. I never held back on that. And secondly, 
though some of us who did appear on the media from time to time, my friend Paul Anthony McDermott would be a prime example of that, who felt it was their duty to demystify the law and explain it as to, as to what was going on. And so you, you have those two resources, if you like, and I, I, I suppose one of your, well, really my question is this, <laughs> <laughs> apart from going and sitting down with a lawyer and saying, look, I really know, need to know about the process of wardship or the process of examinership of, of companies, which, by the way, is Chapter 11 in the United States of America. How did you actually go about gaining that knowledge? I mean, okay, people might talk to you, but you're only getting a snippet. And one of the things that's really important is the overall view. So how, how did you get that? Well, <clears throat> I suppose by reading judgments, mm -hmm. uh, by getting books and pleadings, um, that's a whole different area in itself because getting access to court documents was a huge problem. It's, it has improved a huge amount since I started. I started covering the High Court in 1996, and there was an attitude uh, uh, among, among lawyers, uh, some lawyers, and, uh, and among some court staff that really the media have no business getting access to anything. Okay, and so we, we just explain yeah, this, it, yeah. because I think we should, because um, the courts are a public forum, so a reporter is entitled to go in, but you in fact have an entitlement to sit in the solicitor's bench, mm -hmm. so you are privileged in one respect. But the one thing which tends to explain a case, and certainly as a judge, I used to always get the feeling statement of claim of cases about the defence, what is the defence. Now, you weren't able to get access to that, or to, in our court, for instance, written submissions where people are explaining why they're taking up an attitude. Mm -hmm. So how did you manage uh, to get to the position where you could get those documents? Um, well, wheedling them out of a lot of people was part of it. Um, uh, some people were more amenable to that than others. There were some excellent lawyers who we talked to believe very strongly in the notion that justice yeah. should be administered in public, and their attitude was, if it's open in court, you're in like, yeah. that's in it. Uh, and that has moved on now to if they're before the judge were entitled to the documents. But it, it was difficult, and I remember knocking in desperation at some judge's doors, saying, will you please order somebody to give me some papers, because it is impossible to write this. It, particularly commercial cases, uh, and and there would be some times when, you know, some of the lawyers wouldn't necessarily want their case reported on. So some, uh, uh, one who I won't name, but who became a very senior judge, became very adept at uh, mumbling their way through an affidavit. Uh, and you'd be going, I, we'd be all looking at each other and reports, but what would he say? And, if, and that's really important if you're dealing with Figures in a commercial case, you know, it's important if it's one million or it's one hundred thousand, or it, it, you know, this very serious material. So sometimes it was hugely frustrating. In, in a small minority of cases, we couldn't actually report it because we didn't have the documents, and that used to enrage me. To be honest, uh, um, sometimes you just try every effort and. Um, you just wouldn't get them. I, I remember one example, there was a doctor who uh, was struck off on a Friday evening hearing uh, over a series of very controversial procedures where women had their wounds removed. And uh, I was the only reporter in court. And the judge uh, it came out, he said he had read all the documents in chambers. And he said, I'm conscious the media are here in court and they are entitled to the papers. And then I had a two hour battle with the register who said to me, Do you not think the doctor has suffered enough? Okay. So yeah. that's, uh, yeah. you know, so now that's an extreme example. But it was an indication, there was an attitude in some quarters that I will decide what's reported. Um, and that sometimes I would feel in certain sensitive cases. You know, you would feel uh, you're conscious of the impact your report is going to have on somebody, but it's in the public interest it's reported. Uh, so that's a dilemma sometimes. It's not that we're inhuman, and, uh, and sometimes I took decisions of my own, which I probably wasn't entitled to do, 
just to leave somebody's name out because you got the message across and wasn't necessarily always important to put somebody's name in. Yeah. It, it, sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Um, but so can I it, ask you about that? Because yeah. I, I know it's a problem. But um, we're not all necessarily at the same level of sensitivity, but I suppose journalism can be a brutal thing from time to time. And I presume as well that over the course of the years you have been approached by people who have said to you, please don't report this. Now an example would be, for instance, a politician who's up on a drunk driving charge, let's say nothing very serious happens, but it could ruin their career. So um, is there an overall principle or is it a, a, I am a holier than now uh, kind of individual because I'm acting in the public interest? Is there, is there any way you, as, way you assess whether you should report or should not report? And um, because of the nature of, I suppose, what's happened to people and, and their, their feelings about it? Well, it's, I mean, it's changed now, but I remember covering, say, some uh, in, some cases in their professionals list. Um, you might have cases where a nurse would be struck off she, because she had a serious alcohol and drugs problem, and somebody might have gone through the ringer or whatever, and there was no actual damage inflicted on any patient or whatever, and now, now actually they have a system where they kind of put no naming orders in those cases now, but in the past when you had an option sometimes to name them, I wouldn't, um, because I just felt it wasn't necessary in the public interest, but uh, in terms of Actually, the worst possible thing you could think if somebody approaches me and asks me, please leave their name out, I feel duty bound to put their name in because I've been approached. Even, you know, so the worst possible thing, for future reference, anyone, do not say, don't name me, because then you're doomed. <laughs> can, can I ask you what, what's perhaps a related question? And that is this like, you know me to see very well, but equally, I know you to see very well. You're practically part of the furniture in the four courts. Now, well, <laughs> well, I think I think we're all getting uh, none of us are getting any younger. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's it, it's it's this problem. It's the problem of the pet reporter. Now, the idea of that would be, and it, it, it came up in something that I was involved in, where someone was accused actually publicly of being a pet reporter. Again, I'm not going to mention the circumstances. I'm not going to mention the name. And but I said. It, to to an extent, if you know me, if you know so many other people who are on the bench, if you know barristers, if we are sources properly, I might say, of information about the law or relating to what happened at court, is there a sense that you then become like the teacher's pet, that you backpedal on things, that judges are beyond criticism, that the courts are beyond criticism, that you behave yourself um, that because you would have become, in effect, part of the family? Um, it's, it's, it's a good question and it's a difficult question to answer because I have been around the courts for a long time and I have become friendly with, uh, not with everyone, mind you, there's some people who would like to stick arrows in me, <laughs> but um, uh, yes, it is difficult because you get to like people, you, you get to respect them or whatever, um, but if if some, if I feel something has to be written, though, uh, it's going to not go down too well in certain quarters or whatever. I suppose there was a con controversy about a particular senior judicial appointment, and I had to write about that, and that was uh, that was difficult um, because I knew there were. There was a strength of feeling on both sides of the equation, and there's always there's an individual in the middle in all of these things. Um, so it's difficult. Um, uh, I have uh, lost some friendships because I've had to, and I feel I've had to write things. Um, uh, I I got to think I've never done anything unfairly or imbalanced. But uh, like to me, they're the two clear key things. It should be balanced and it should be fair. But it should also be reported if it's in the public interest. It should be reported if judges are the way they shouldn't be behaving. It should be reported. So uh, and the same goes for 
lawyers, anyone else the same goes for journalists. Uh, I, like I'm very conscious I could be the next one being written about tomorrow. It, 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 you know, it, you don't know what come around the corner. So, but in a way, I do kind of believe in published and be damned to an extent. Yeah. But but I'm not immune to arguments where I mean, there's, there's obviously restrictions and say wards of court or special care cases or all of those. You'd never dream of publishing anything that might identify anybody like that. Um, but there's other cases where they just have to be reported yeah. and people have to be identified. So can I ask you another question, which is uh, related to, uh, well, there's some debate as to the constitutional position of journalists. And as we're aware, if you take countries which are under oppression, where you can't speak freely, it seems the first thing that happens is, and it may be a two-stage process, first of all, a very rich person takes over and buys the entire media. So they're all saying wonderful things about that person, the person whose party that person supports. And then the second stage is even worse, where if you, uh, for instance, use the word war, as we know in Russia in a particular context, you may find yourself thrown out of your job and ostracized. But the alternative to that, in a way, is the very free media which we have in this country, which is only subject to defamation law and perhaps toothless press complaints procedure. What's your take on the necessity for press freedom? Oh, I think press freedom is crucial in any democracy, and I think we're seeing examples where that doesn't happen. I think in, in, in a democracy, information, and I mean information, not opinion, uh, information is key, and uh, the media are a crucial part of providing that information. And I do worry what is happening to information and news, uh, like in a, in a way, and truth. There's, I, I think they are all being lost in a maelstrom of comment and opinion and algorithms. And one of the things I do worry about, like when I was growing up, you, you know, you read newspapers and all that kind of thing, and all, almost by accident or osmosis, you might be picking or leafing through the paper to find something, but you come across other articles and you might read them, and that all affects your viewpoint and. And I just w worry about algorithms that feed people only information that they think the person wants to hear. And I think that's very damaging. Uh, so I, I do worry about what's going to happen to information and truth. Uh, like we see in America, the situation in America uh, where, you know, a, a lack of information and truth is impacting on politics in a very destructive way. And it's impacting on democracy, and and I I feel that that's probably going to become a worse trend. Uh, and I am conscious, like on, from social media and everything. And I, I don't bash social media. I think there's a lot of good things about social media, but even there's a lot of comment about the Irish Times having an agenda. Uh, and of course, the Irish Times has an agenda. It's owned by particular. Uh, people with probably a particular worldview and a mindset. And, uh, but we also, as reporters, uh, I have to check facts. Whatever I write has to go through a fact-checking procedure. I'm talking about news now and reporters as opposed to opinion. And, um, and that doesn't happen in a lot of other sources of uh, news that people are getting their source from and they're forming their views on those and, and that does worry me. So I do worry about the future yeah, of the media. Sure. But I know there's some moves, I was chatting with somebody from the Department of Justice last night and they were talking about there are there are some moves maybe to have perhaps uh, fund, for the state to fund sources of uh, information gathering but they would be specific like court reporting or report sure. to parliament. Yeah. No, I understand that. And, and one of the things that, that's happening now, please correct me if I'm wrong in saying this, but I understand both the Irish population, 3% the Irish Times, that's both online and in terms of buying, or as they say in England, taking a, a newspaper. Um, but obviously the influence is much wider in the sense that the people who read it are themselves perhaps 
arts broadcasters or, or influence makers, as they say. But we know that that whole process, the process that I go through every day of buying a newspaper and actually reading it, which you're aware of, from, from the point of view of being informed and entertained, that's shrinking all the time. And instead, it looks to me as if perhaps a less informed fringe who are just full of anger uh, are taking over social media and podcasts uh, have become very popular, for instance, with the younger generation. So that people are reading those. Ganesh, I know in the Financial Times, had an article at the weekend about because of the shrinking media, journalists are talking about other journalists. Look, where do you see the whole trend going? Because we, we've seen it alarmingly going against the print media and in favour of, well, perhaps uninformed comment over the course of the last 50 years. Where do you see it going? Well, I, I think print media is, or the printed page is on the way out, essentially. I don't think anyone under 50 likes newspapers. So uh, I think just an acceptance of that. I mean, in the Irish Times, the policy is digital first and probably digital only. So that's fine. But that's the way people are going to get their sources of news in the future. Like, I personally will miss the printed page because I still like reading a printed newspaper. But um, I would be concerned uh, for all the reasons I was saying about where it is going mm. uh, and, and what, it, what is going to happen to information mm. and, and news and who's going to produce it. So I, I, I think that's a key yeah, issue. If there, is, that, if there isn't a profit model there in reporting, news, yes. well then there's not going to be any accurate news. That, and that's the problem, paper. and it, with the best will in the world, you can see a lot of uh, traditional media or mainstream media, you know, chasing what we call clickbait, you know, putting up stories that, and you think people would click on irrespective of their merit. Um, so I think that's quite worrying, but it, it kind of, I also understand that uh, media organisations have to survive, so there will probably be a balance between what I would call real news and real information and the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, I, I'm all for entertainment, don't get me wrong. But uh, and there's, a lot, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff I read that wouldn't qualify as news or information. But um, uh, there has to be a balance. Sure. People have to be informed. Yeah, now look, one of the things I want to ask you is this. Um, all of the people sitting here, including myself, <laughs> we have to produce things, we have to produce a written document. Um, for instance, uh, it may be an academic document, it may be a judgment, it may be an essay. But one of the things you've done since you have become a um, legal affairs correspondent of the Irish Times has been to produce very detailed articles on issues that are of public moment. For instance, expert witnesses is one. Tribunals in the future uh, could be another. So you have these topics, and you have to explain, I suppose, to the general public the pluses and the minuses, what's happening now, what might go wrong, where things might go in the future. So really, this is, a, I suppose, a teaching question, as you have a page dip, is how do you go about that? How would you advise people to go about like, putting together a major article of a couple of thousand words? Um, well, the main thing is decide... Uh, what you want to say. Uh, it's probably the kind of articles you're talking about uh, are they're academic articles, so you're it's different. Like ours are much more focused. You've got the who, when, where, why, how all in their intro. Uh, but there are lessons to be learned from it. Uh, it, it know your audience. You, you know, if you're pitching it towards a more general audience, avoid the legalese. Avoid the treble negatives. Uh, I, I used to be reading judgment and going, what is going on here? Is it not, 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 not? And, the, and you would actually have to decipher the whole thing. Peter, of course, is not remotely guilty of this. But um, some are. Um, uh, and sometimes I think articles are excessively lengthy. Uh, they don't need to be. Uh, most things can be communicated, apart from kind of complex judgment where you have to put in case on yeah. and then that's going to 
had a sure. judgment. But are you talking about no, academic articles? No, I'm not talking about academic articles. Journal articles. articles, 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 articles or, or, uh, discussing this, like, with one of my colleagues, Sarah Hogan. Yeah. So we both have a policy. We start off judgment by saying the very first line what this is going to be about. <laughs> and then I suppose if I'm writing something, what I have in my head is a number of bullet points. I have to deal with blah, 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 mm. blah, 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 and I go down and through them. And as I'm going through them, I'm thinking of other things that maybe I need to deal with. And then you have to reach a point. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. This, after all, is not Shakespeare or Dante or whatever it is. It's not. It's something that's ephemeral. It will pass away. But do you follow the same process? In other words, what I really need to get across in this article is the following proposition. And to do that, I have certain guide points that I'm going to try and anchor this thing to. Is, yeah. that, is that how you do it? Um, yes. Well, it, a lot of the material I write now in this role is uh, you're often presenting two sides mm-hmm. uh, of an argument. So you have to get people lined up on both sides uh, to, to kind of outline their positions. And you also have to summarize your uh, your basic points to what the what the what the article is about uh, in, in the in the intro, um, and it's also kind of what we call the lead into it is very important. Mm. Uh, yeah, like we often would start with a you know a particularly pity quote or. Um, some controversial comment or whatever, like our agenda is different really. We have to draw the reader in immediately. Um, they're going to move on very fast if, if they're not drawn in immediately. So that's the challenge for for us really. Like once you get the first few paragraphs right, you can you can incorporate yeah. everything else. So uh, but it, it's it's very important to get all sides across very important to get it legal so you won't be sued and there's all of these factors that you have to bear in mind but it's like my main focus when I'm writing those kind of articles is to try and reduce the legalese and try and communicate to people what is going on here and what, why it matters and what are the different positions on this particular issue. Okay, without necessarily coming down to, to one thing. Yeah, saying. often you, yeah. that's common then. Yeah, there is sure. the reporting on comments are two very, very yeah. different things. So I'm, you know? my final question, and then we're going to throw it open to the floor and, 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 and you think what questions you have uh, to ask Mary. Um, I could, say, I could put it as bluntly as this, what do you think of defamation law? <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, um, well, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Well, well, because I, you're I entitled actually, to a point well, of view. One of my jobs for the afternoon is to watch the Joint Justice Committee, which is going to be discussing the Defamation Act uh, and the proposed changes. Um, what do I think of defamation law? Uh, it needs reform. Uh, not sure getting rid of juries is a good reform. Uh, why, they, why, do you, why do you think that? Happens? Because I know there's a perception that they can give crazy awards. Mm-hmm. But I also think a jury is the best person to assess the damage to one of their peers. Mm-hmm. You, you know, I um, think judges live a lot more in the real world than they did in the past. So judges are, a lot of judges are in a position to do that too. So... Like literally for me now, the jury is out, and whether the jury should be out, okay. I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this um, this um, uh, meeting this evening will kind of maybe kind of help me solidify my views on it. I, one of the my big beefs with defamation as has happened, there was, there was no defence of honest mistake. You know, particularly as a court reporter, you're right in front of me, and particularly with the internet now you have to get something up in about three minutes and uh, and you can make an honest mistake and it just the whole notion about being sued about putting in the incorrect uh, christian name or, or or whatever that might be up for about five minutes before it's yeah. spotted there's an error or whatever so that kind of stuff really gets my goat so i hope that they will do something to address that i mean that's a completely different point of view than, you know, publishing a detailed article that 
uh, and I, I have seen some uh, defamation cases for, against the media where I, I feel uh, I am glad they found against this particular publication because it was an appalling article. Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff can't be stood over, mm -hmm. so I don't have any issue with that. What I have an issue with is where reporters are genuinely trying to do their job and they make mistakes and uh, your the punishment for that can be massive. Yeah, well, uh, I, well I've, I've seen that because yeah. in my very early days in the bar I was friendly yeah. uh, with a reporter and, and, well, I can remember the aftermath of particular cases or particular settlements that happened that I didn't think was particularly fair. And one of the things I must say that puzzles me is uh, damage to your reputation. Why wouldn't it be in the circuit court? Mm -hmm. um, why would it really be worth more than 75000 I mean, you know um, Othello by Shakespeare uh, and how he takes the view. That, look, um, the plain reality is you are what you are no matter what people say about you. And if you're concerned about what people say about you, then you cease effectively to be yourself. Shakespeare mm -hmm. puts it a lot different. But um, the whole panoply of a trial in the high court in front of a jury where there are so many multiple defences, including now uh, public interest defence. I mean, does that fill you with no, trepidation? I, or No, and I would really agree with you in terms of the circuit court, but occasionally the high court, yes. I, I mean, if you look at, uh, well, kind of, if somebody, uh, if something is published that suggests you're a sex abuser or whatever, that's very serious. Mm. Um, so, but... Yeah, in general, I think the awards are crazy. Uh, okay, well, that was, that's been a leading question. I mean, I'm actually told you to say that. All right, so... Uh, it's um, nothing I haven't said yeah, before. No, I know. Uh, so, I've been speaking to Mary yeah. for half an hour, and you're just as valuable in terms of any questions you may ask or contributions you have. And it can be just in, in the shape of a comment you might like to make that Mary might like to comment on. So you certainly are free to yes. Uh, so you mentioned about AI and AI's role in misinformation. Oh, don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> and particularly recently, obviously, with, there's been fake news, but also the fact that there are entire articles now that have been written by AI that have been published. Um, but I suppose on the other side of it, there are a lot of proponents of AI in the legal sphere who argue that access to justice is one of the leading problems around the globe, and that AI can speed up a lot of currently entirely paper-based processes and that it's a huge access to justice issue. So I suppose bearing those things in mind, I suppose, what would you say to that? Well, I haven't firmly made up my mind on where I stand on AI at, at the moment. Uh, I do worry about it. I, I worry about uh, the p potential impact of it. I can see it could be a force for, uh, for good uh, and could be very useful. In, in a lot of respects, but I suppose the issue is who controls it and who manages it, and particularly who manages the future development of it and the use of it. So I think just just there's a lot of nefarious people out there. So. I'm Stanley Kubrick was ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah. So um, I haven't firmly made up my mind on it. You know, I suppose I have a kind of. Natural kind of uh, trepidation <laughs> about it, yeah, that's the word. Yeah. A point that really interested me was when you were speaking about that in some cases, with maybe some very prominent individuals coming to you after and saying, Please don't report on that. Something, and maybe I would like to take it a step further and ask you about more serious, perhaps, threats that do exist when reporting on legal issues. And speaking on that, my mom did go to the Lake Blanca here, and I wonder, are those threats, something that you've experienced, whether with yourself or just in the legal journalism space in the last, really, throughout your career, and do you feel like there are safeguards in that regard for, you know, reporting on legal issues and perhaps very dangerous individuals? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I have had some threats, but thankfully, I kind of nothing, nothing uh, that's altered anything. Um, but, um, and I knew Veronica Guerin, and that was a, a, a dreadful time. Um, it's 
we had in the the Irish Times management organised a security briefing for journalists to address some of these issues because there have been so, uh, some incidents, where, say when covering uh, far right protests, uh, there's been a lot of threats to journalists. Um, uh, you know, people trying to take the camera off them, people filming them, and then put the material up on social media and then say lots of things that are completely untrue and defamatory. Um, so, yeah, that is worrying because I think particularly in the context of the far-right protests, it's worrying where that will go. Um, I, w I would hope in terms of the criminal context, um, a, a lot of those, I think the gangland stuff or whatever, um, I think they're, they're, the measures that were taken post Veronica Gear, and I think that hopefully will deter any of those direct appalling attacks, you, you know, but I, there's a lot of insidious stuff going on and there's a lot of people stoking up hatred, literally, and uh, almost inciting violence against mainstream journalists or, or whatever. So we've had discussions about when we cover protests, should we identify ourselves and uh, or go incognito and... Uh, it's difficult. You have to balance a lot of factors. So, um, you know, we had a we had a briefing from the guard, but a lot of it was very matter of fact stuff. But I think most people would know themselves anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a work in progress, and uh, I would be concerned how it might develop. Yeah. Um, but can I ask the gentleman in the white chair if you had your hand up or your own? Thank you. Uh, to what extent did you include your personal opinion? Uh, on any particular case when writing um, uh, an article? Um, well, I don't write comments or opinion. I write reports, uh, so there should be no personal opinion. So, uh, so can't you like, uh, reformulate, uh, to, what, to what extent does your personal opinion um, lead, uh, lead you when deciding to make a comment or opinion? Either this case or this case. Yeah, I, 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 I get you. Well, uh, when you, when I was a court reporter, you don't have a huge amount of choice about what you're reporting. Your news desk will t tell you what you're reporting. Sometimes you might get tip off from lawyers. They have a good case, and you go and report that. Um, I would have had a certain amount of selectivity about, say, on a quiet day. Uh, I did I did report a lot of ward support. I found that area of uh, law very interesting and also concerns humans and I'm more interested in the humans who are stuck in the legal system really than heavy commercial cases or whatever. So I would be moving more towards those and in criminal cases where it's very interesting in criminal cases. But there's always a bit of you in every article, I think, uh, because you could present the same set of facts to 10 reporters and uh, they should have all the basic facts in the story, but the presentation of them might be slightly different. So, that would, but it should be fair, it should be balanced, and it isn't. You're not doing your job, particularly as a court reporter. Okay. So, would you like to go next and then we'll take that lady there and then that's okay, I'm sorry. Never mind, not really. I, I know we've been introduced, but yeah. next slide up in my head. Sorry, I mean, just imagine in relation to um, the move from paper uh, reports to online, and you said you have to almost churn out articles within, say, 30 minutes, see if I'm not whether and, and the scope of, you know, defamation obviously going to the furthest extent. But, um, do you find that there's more scrutiny on um, journalists and your peers, perhaps, like from yes. that move and, and maybe pressure, perhaps, uh, in terms of getting stuff right? Yeah, it's stressful. Uh, I'm aware there's certain lawyers who are paid to scrutinise the Irish Times articles in particular. So it is stressful. Uh, um, you, I mean, what we try and do is say in a big judgment or whatever, just get the bottom line, who won, who were lost. Not always simple, but a Supreme Court judgment might be very new on. <laughs> um, but that's essentially what we try to do. But uh, I mean, you, you'll all know yourself as, as uh, involved in the law. It, it, it's not that simple. 
uh, there were a lot of news desks. If I had my way, I would have every news editor in the courts for a week, mm -hmm. so they would stop asking the stupid questions. <laughs> like, uh, there's a case in the High Court, and I'm going, what High Court? Oh, there's more than one High Court. I'm going, right, okay. So, but um, yeah, and uh, I still live in dread of the solicitor's letter. Uh, so <laughs> it, it it is stressful. You just have to do the best you can. The the, the internet is there. It has to be dealt with. Uh, and uh, I mean, yeah, I dislike the pressure. The pressure to be first. Uh, yeah. But that's a huge pressure now. Mm -hmm. is to have to yeah. have your story up first. I would prefer to have. Be absolutely sure it's correct before it's up first, but you just have to do your best. Okay. So, definitely, yeah. Hi. Um, sorry, I was going to ask you, um, obviously, the Constitution says that just to fill your public policy in the future will be very important to fill that. Um, but there obviously are exceptions to that rule, which is the case for the camera, and the courts are going to be able to use the paper of the courts on policy and be anonymized when they're reacting to some of the judgments as well, in cases maybe involving children. more clarity because um, I have seen some cases where Section 27 orders are slapped on them uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about minors or whatever or health cases, they're just slapped on them and I'm not really sure what the reason is and uh, the, the, the kind of uh, bad part of my brain is wondering if somebody protecting somebody mm -hmm. uh, or somebody, uh, I won't, won't name any names. But um, so yes, I would like more guidance, particularly when use of a Section Twenty Seven order. You know when it can be applied and when it can't. Uh, like I'm thinking of a particular case where a well-known person got a Section Twenty Seven over personal injury settlement recently, and I can't for the life of me yeah. work what well, they apply. I mean, that happens yeah. to us as well. We yeah. come and suddenly we see a case, and instead of a name, it's initials. Yes. The first question we ask, like, why is that? Yes. And you need to know. Yes. Yeah. Well, we our, did challenge sure. one, and uh, the judge quietly said, "All right, oh yeah, before you can come in." Yeah, but it's about, uh, it's about fifteen yeah. different sections of different acts yeah. which may yeah. be applied in particular yeah. circumstances. But what, one of the common ones is. If people are convicted of all sex offences, yes, they're named unless that identifies the victim. But sometimes you can get some, you know, quite far-fetched reasons whereby the victim might be identified. But anyway, I'm not going to talk. Yeah. So would you no, like I would. To I would love to precise guide, and I think it would be brilliant. Well, I'd like them too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I have uh, two points to my questions. The first one is: um, Do you think that the the role of the journalists and the media have sort of influenced people to get more involved with their local government. And the second part is, do you think that, that sort of the media has both sort of played a vital role in sort of exposing sort of horrific acts committed by the government, um, such as, say, the Tuskegee uh, experiments, as well as sort of helping to sort of prevent that from sort of um, further happening in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the whole point of, well, for me now, the whole point of journalism is to speak truth to power and to kind of uh, comfort the objective and the comfortable. Uh, the comfortable aren't only as objective as I would like them to be. But um, yeah, I think the media has played a huge role in exposing, uh, or just, just even uh, drawing attention to kind of sexual abuse scandals, uh, you know, um, kind of lack of services, uh, there's sometimes you feel like you're banging your head against the wall. But, like I was at a, um, a, a conference last night in relation to 10 years of the Child Law Project and I was covering cases 20 plus years ago about the lack of appropriate places mm -hmm. for children in, in care with special needs and it's still the same. Yeah. I feel like I've been writing the same story for 20 plus years. Well, I can say so, yeah, so, I mean, sometimes you would despair, but yes, the media absolutely has a role. That's what the media should be writing about, not, not clickbait. 
<laughs> we take two, two, well, three more questions. One, two, three, and then we're done. Is that okay? Yeah, so you were first. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about how do you get your genes from the nutrition and the Do you there? That is a very hard question. Uh, I would actively encourage people to get involved in journalism, uh, particularly young people, that, and there's some fantastic young journalists in, in, in the Irish Times. It's a tough career at the moment. There's um, there's a, a lot of pressures, um, pressure, not as much job security as there would have been in the past. Uh, uh, contracts are shorter um, or whatever, but. But I think the bottom line in any career is if you're good and if you're a hard worker, you will always get work. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, so I would I would encourage people. It, it can be tough, but then law can be tough too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So two so. and then three, is that okay? So yeah, yeah. Um, I just in line with that point that you made about comparing things about COVID in checks. There was an uh, article in the Irish Times just before Christmas that drew my eye about and um, a number of media outlets taking the case against the defense forces to make the state in respect of um, the media not being able to report on like martial law and martial court. And I think oh, it was yeah. after some reports were made on an actual trial in the yeah. uh, defense forces. And I'm probably like paraphrasing the state's argument, but it looked at terms, but it was something like the defense forces are under the president, so they're protect, uh, protected under the constitution. And it was upheld on the behalf of and so, in the meantime, the A very cynical answer to the national security because uh, arguments uh, in those cases because I have covered some of those court martials and they're essentially about very bad behaviour in barracks by soldiers uh, and bullying and intimidation and worse and that's really what the army are trying to protect from uh, and that's why the media organisation took that application. Uh, and I do think there is a whole issue there to be addressed. I don't know if it can be addressed by legislation or whatever, but for the moment, in, in terms of those court martial conduct, they are literally a law unto themselves in terms of what we can report. And there's a lot of stuff that we are not permitted to report that absolutely should be reported because it's dreadful. So I don't... Uh, Peter might have a better idea in no, terms of if there could be a legal intention or whatever. I'm not expressing a view on yeah, that at all, at all, at all. No, I agree. Really, really no, I know, I know. I don't know, but I mean, I suppose one of the dangers but yes, it's about, very about, about having any privilege yeah. is that it can be misused. I'm not saying yeah. it was, but if, if it's there, it can be. Yeah. So, but you, you have your point of view, and yeah. I don't necessarily agree with it, or <laughs> not necessarily disagree. So the last question then is. Um, so I'm curious if you could like say in this model a lot of large mainstream media organizations. How or what do you think specifically legal journalism can do to sort of adapt in these times and maintain its integrity, not just in these uh, increasingly editorialized. Uh, sections of the papers and whatnot. It's a difficult balance uh, and. Like at, at, almost on a daily basis, uh, at news conferences or whatever, is, is the battle is going on. Kind of what should be run, what shouldn't be run, uh, what should be prioritised. Uh, I know even in the court, there's uh, a lot of lawyers have been giving out to me about uh, the absence of more serious court cases on the court page or whatever. And, I just like to say I don't decide what goes in the court page, <laughs> uh, but but that is part of the argument, and uh, so it's always trying to balance uh, 
between the news and the information on the or the, the news and the clickbait and the entertainment and the opinion and there's a lot of opinion. I would like to see more news uh, and less opinion. But we all have different views on it. Uh, and of course, I'm not the editor, so I don't deserve it. It's in the first line. Is that the next step? No, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to thank Barry. It's been a very entertaining discussion. It's been a chance for me to have a chat with her too about things that were on my mind. And thank you all very much for your very entertaining and very good questions. So thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank you.